Hi, uh, my name is Gareth Slager. I'm the digital editor for the Fabricator.com, and we are doing a series of interviews with contestants from the Netflix show Metal Shop Masters. Uh, on today's episode, we are interviewing Ivan Eiler. He's an he's a metal sculpture artist out of uh, St. John's, Michigan. So let's let's uh, go back a little bit to some of your background. Um, how did the love of like metalworking kind of take root? How did the love of metalworking take root? Yeah. Well, really, to be honest, it was uh, it was the artistic side of things that was really uh, the start for it. Yeah. Now, when it came to uh, working with metal, I actually started doing that um, because I was building motorcycles, and so that was really where I got my start in uh, metal fabrication. But I started doing metal sculpture right off the bat as well, so. I was making little things, putting them in galleries in Lansing, which is the closest big city to me. And then as I was doing that, I just kind of uh, kept doing both. And there was more money in motorcycles, so I started a motorcycle shop. You know, I never really sold any sculptures or anything. It was just something I did because I was passionate about it. And then as I went on from there, um, I started getting recognition as a sculpture or a sculptor. And so that's when I started to actually get more into sculpting, sure. metal sculpting. Now, one of the things that I really love about working with metal is, I mean, the sky's the limit. You can really, you can make anything you want. There's a million different ways to do what you want to do because you're dealing with a material that's, you know, so solid in its form. You can use a lot of negative space and things. So the kind of stuff that I would paint or draw, you know, I can recreate in three dimension. And so I, I appreciate that aspect of it. There's just something about forming something out of metal with your hands. It's just very elemental. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I was looking back at, uh, you talked with Josh Welton when we, when we met up at SEMA and he was, t you guys were talking about how, you know, the spectrum of working with metal is almost endless now considering like how much the spectrum of technology has expanded quite. I, I know you said that you don't use a lot of computers and some of the more advanced technology. Um, but have you started incorporating more of that into your, your work lately? Um, no, not really. Um, I have a CNC plasma cutter. I've had one for a few years, but I've got a new one now from, from fast cut. And it's, uh, it's a hell of a lot nicer than my old machine. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll do a lot of that kind of stuff, especially like, uh, like, let's say I'm going to make a tree, you know, and I want to put, you know, foliage on it. So I want to make like a bonsai tree that's actually, you know, full of leaves. Well, if I'm going to be cutting out the same shape of leaves and I cut them out by hand, all it's going to do is take me longer. It's not going to look any different or be any different to use the machine. So in that aspect, I'll, I'll definitely use the plasma cutter because I can just go, okay, I want to chop out, you know, a thousand of these out of the sheet and then just hit a button and away you go. Sure. And save you uh, days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's go back a little bit more to, um, your your like entry into this this uh, this industry because um, I know I think we talked a little bit at SEMA. You said you kind of jumped around from job to job before you kind of started your your motorcycle shop. Um, what, what kind of jobs were those? Were you working in metal fabrication shops? Were you working in uh, other manufacturing factories? Um, I worked at a couple factory jobs. I was never doing metal fabrication. Um, you know, I didn't really have a money for college or anything like that. I kind of barely graduated high school. So a lot of that for me was, uh, was just, you know, kind of trying to find whatever job I could find. And since this is Michigan factory jobs, they're, they're all over. I mean, yeah. there used to be a lot more than there is now, but you know, so for me, it was literally just, I need, you know, money to pay the bills. I started out as a tattoo artist actually when I was about 17 and, uh, did an apprenticeship, worked at a tattoo shop and, the economy started going bad and you know people couldn't pay their rent so they weren't getting tattoos so was that like around 2008 yeah yeah, yeah it was right, actually, right when the, the downturn turn took place huh well it was actually before that this was uh um God, what would this have been because the 2008 downturn that was actually i was already working at a gas station by then so this would have been years before that so it wasn't uh, wasn't as bad as the the housing market crash but but I just remember uh, something was going on. People were having a hard time keeping bills paid, like I said. And so 
you know, there was a lot of jobs going under. It could have been, uh, it might have been a more localized problem with the economy. You know, we had a lot of factory shutdowns and things like that. A lot of GM jobs went under. And we had, uh, I had some issues there. But uh, yeah, so I stopped working as a tattoo artist, went and got a job in a factory. The economy got a little worse in that factory shutdown. But even there, I wasn't doing metal fabrication. I was running a hot press, pressing out plastic parts for car interiors. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, I found myself working at a gas station after, uh, you know, after a couple of factories shut down and was literally making seven dollars and fifty cents an hour. And that was uh, that was 2008 in the economy, you know, it was like really tanking. And then it was like, OK, well, I, at this point, there's literally nothing left to lose. So I started the motorcycle shop and started building bikes and building parts for bikes and just kind of climbed up doing that. It seemed like a way I could do my artwork because, you know, you're still forming things out of metal, you're painting. You know, you're doing leather work, leather tooling. So all the things that I love to do, all tied into one, and you could ride it down the road. So, you know, I, how did you I get that shop? A, Sorry, how did how did you get that motorcycle shop off the ground? Uh, really, it was it was kind of scary at first. I didn't have very much money, um, and so it was just like we I rented a building. I didn't have enough money to really put much on the shelves of anything, but put what I could up and and just opened the doors and kind of hoped that uh that people would come through one of the biggest things that got me started and got me going though and kept the bills paid was a uh, hardtail uh, that i designed and came up with so you could chop the back end off your sportster and plug on this you know this weld on hardtail and uh you know drop your frame down and give you a nice long line and stretch the bike out lower it down and i had bolt-on ones as well so it was the parts that i was actually making that really kind of kept the money coming in at first. There wasn't a whole lot of customers just walking in off the street, but sure. uh, but yeah, that's that's how I kept it going. It was with the uh, parts I was selling online. And did you have much metalworking experience before that, or were you just kind of figuring out as it went went on? Uh, I had a lot of metal fabricating experience before that, but it was all just uh, from doing it on my own. I started welding when I was about fifteen or sixteen years old, um, just because I wanted to. So I wanted to build a motorcycle. And, I had a summer job. It was like a keep kids out of trouble kind of job. And sure. <laughs> so I saved up some money and bought a CB750. And yeah, I wanted to chop the frame apart and weld it up. So that's when I uh, started getting into welding. So so this program that you joined when you're about 15 kind of kind of set the pace for uh, where you are now. Well, it wasn't a welding program or anything. It was just like a summer job. I just used the money to get the motorcycle. Uh, I was actually a janitor. <laughs> It was just like, a, oh, okay, here's some troubled kids. Uh, let's give them a job during the summer. It'll keep them out of trouble. Gotcha. You know, so I made like five dollars an hour as a janitor. Um, so, uh, how did you get into creating little pieces of art with metal? Well, it was really just because, like I said, I've always, you know, I mean, I was the kid that was scribbling on the desk. I was always drawing. I was always trying to make something. I made things out of clay all the time. You know, it was just. Uh, just kind of always had an artistic bug. I always wanted to be creating something. And so as soon as I started, you know, working on building that motorcycle, it was at the same time I was just grabbing random things and welding them together. So it kind of happened right at the same time. Like I said, I started taking things to galleries. There was the Dancing Crane, uh, the Lansing Art Gallery, were a couple of different places that I took things to. And uh, yeah, I didn't really sell them that often, but you know, Again, I was just a just a kid starting out. Didn't have a name for myself or anything, but I did sell one piece for two hundred and fifty dollars. It made me pretty proud. But that was uh, that was about it. I think it's the only thing I ever sold out of a gallery. And that's all it takes is that that one moment where you create something and someone shows enough interest in buying it that that'll kind of set you know your interest for for years to come. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely validating, especially when you're young like that. It's like, oh, okay, somebody. Somebody likes what I'm doing. I've got something in. Yeah. The piece that I sold there, it was a, uh, it was a bird, but it was kind of a skeletonized bird. So it had the the wings came out in branches, and it had like the feathers were actually cut out of a photograph. It was when uh, it was when the satellites were showing up to Saturn. Mm. I've always been a bit of a, you know, a bit of a science nerd. I love to know how things work and anything that we're up to or, or what we're doing, I'm always interested in. So I was paying close attention as we, as the satellites were coming in, uh, getting close to Saturn. And so we got these images back, you know, from NASA. And so I had a photo printed of that image that came back, cut it into uh, 
like cut the photo into feathers and then put the feathers on the bird and then it had ribs on it kind of like how a boat or an airplane would be built between the wings and all that so it kind of looked a bit like a bird also a bit kind of like a da vinci-esque sure. flying contraption some abstract component to it yeah yeah yep yeah with this with this photograph of that image coming back from uh yeah so it was kind of like uh here's where we started here's where we ended up kind of thing and that was the piece i sold and what was what was the next iteration like so you sold that piece and you mm-hmm. kind of got the bug you're like i can do this i can figure it out and were you just kind of doing these side jobs just to kind of support this artistic need no not really to be honest it's just you know i didn't really care if i sold the stuff or not when i took it to the galleries the biggest thing for me was just I just want to be building something. And if I got an idea in my head, I just wanted to make it. And if somebody liked it enough to want to buy it, then I'd sell it to them. So that's kind of how it started. But it was more about just making the pieces I was really interested in more than anything. How did you get, because I know you said you have a lot of kind of large scale pieces around Michigan. Oh, yeah. um, I think there was one, I think it was the world's largest brown trout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, first yeah, of all, how cool. do they determine that that's the world's largest brown trout sculpture in the world? Well, well the funny thing is, is they actually, uh, they kind of put that one on the artists. See, they'll put out RFPs, and RFP is a request for a proposal. And you can go to basically like any um, arts council or anything like that in your area, and they'll have these things. So they'll say, you know, there'll be a company, let's say, and the company is like, okay, we want a sculpture. Or a city's like, we want a sculpture. But they don't know how to go about that because they've never done it before. So they'll go to an arts council and say, how do we do this? The arts council helps them out. But then they also push those RFPs out there to all the artists. So if you just talk to an arts council, they can show you where they put RFPs. And it's basically just, here's this place. They're looking for art. Here's this place. They're looking for art. You know, And then they're kind of uh, helping to connect the people that want the stuff with the artists. So, so that's how that started. It was just a... Uh, it was just a request for a proposal that came through the pipeline and it, it literally just said we we don't care how it's made or how you design it, which is right up my alley because I don't, you know, I don't want to just fabricate things just to fabricate them. Like I've never built anything that another artist designed. I don't really want to do that. Yeah. That's uh, no coming template, up with what I want to build. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but, but this was the closest I came to that just because they knew what they wanted and what they wanted was the world's largest brown trout. I had to uh, just start going and digging around to try and find out where there was other public brown trout sculptures, large sculptures, and then find which one was the largest. And it turned out to be in uh, Gore, New Zealand, of all places. And so I asked him, like, you know, well, how tall is this? You know, in an email, and I got an email back from him, you know, telling me how tall it was. And, you know, then I let him know that uh, what I was doing and, you know, that I was, you know, being commissioned to build the world's largest brown trout. And so I, uh, I just designed and built mine five feet taller. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and I think when we were talking to, in Las Vegas, uh, you mentioned something about Scrap Fest. Yeah, that, Scrap that's kind of like yeah. kind of set another tier to your your career, right? Yeah, Scrap Fest was huge. Scrap Fest was a, a big part of what actually got me to understand like what I was just saying about the RFPs and stuff, because I'd never heard of anything like that before. And you Scrap know, nobody Fest walking is, down the street would, but Scrap Fest Scrap takes Fest place is, in Lansing, right? Yeah, it's in Lansing. Yeah. And basically what it is, is you have all these metal artists coming together and talking to them. That's how I found out like, Hey, you've done a public sculpture before. Where'd you hear about that? How are you doing these things? And so that's where I got some of that information to kind of get the ball rolling. But what Scrap Fest is, is, uh, it's actually one of the coolest shows that, I yeah. think anybody could ever. Imagine. I was looking it up it's a little really, bit. It sounds kind of wild. Oh, it's, uh, it's awesome. Yeah, it's like a it's like a crazy metal artist game show without any cameras because you're literally there at Friedland's, and Friedland's is this really cool old like really old scrapyard. It's right in the middle of Lansing, which seems like a really weird place for a scrapyard, but it's only because it's always been there. You know, like the city was built up around it. Yeah, it's, this thing's been there since. That's the 1800s. very Michigan. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there was actually. Uh, the guy that started Oldsmobile when he was like building concept cars in his garage before he started actually building, he was going there to get scrap metal out of that yard. That's how old that yard is. So there's a lot of cool history there too. And so uh, this guy, David Such, he was a, a artist in Lansing and he was also, a, he ran his own video company and he was just walking down the street one day, passing by the scrapyard and thought, you know what, it's really cool that we have this random scrapyard in the middle of the city. We should, 
what if we had like an art competition? And so he just walked in and talked to the guy who owned the place. And for whatever reason, he thought it was a good idea too. And he said, yes. And then now they have this huge event. So what it is, is artists can come in from anywhere. You all meet up at Friedland's and you're waiting at the gate. You know, you get your safety glasses on and, and you basically can only have two people in the art at one time, no matter how many people you have on your team, you can do it by yourself or have a team. And he just like, you all go in and you find your barrel and, or it's basically like a big basket and they blow an air horn and you got to run out in the yard and you have one hour to gather up 500 pounds of whatever scrap metal you want, throw it in your bin. That's a lot of scrap metal. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 500 pounds. And then once you have all that, then they'll, you know, the hours up, it's like, okay, you're done. It doesn't matter where you're at. And you don't know how much you've got. It's not like your thing sitting on a scale. So you're just grabbing and grabbing and grabbing whatever you think you might need to build, whatever it is that's coming into your head as you're looking at the stuff you're grabbing. So it's really intense. And then after that, everybody gets lined up and one by one fork trucks in a line, drop them on the scale. And you get like three or five minutes to pull out metal until it weighs 500 pounds. If that time runs out, then the workers there will start grabbing stuff out of your bin, whether it's something you really wanted or not until it weighs 500 pounds. Oh, wow. And then it moves along, moves on down the line. So it's, yeah, it's crazy. You have to be thinking too, okay, what's heavy? What can I get rid of? Like, while you're waiting in line, like what can I grab out of here real quick to knock the weight down if I need to, so that I don't end up losing something I really want. And then you get down to that 500 pounds, you load it up into your truck or on your trailer, you take it back to your shop. And it used to be, you'd get two weeks to build, you know, whatever it was, but now they're given, now they're giving us a month. So they changed the rules a bit. Uh, the last year they had it and they haven't had it in two years because of the pandemic. So 2019 was the last year they had it, but uh, they're bringing it back this year. So I'm really excited to uh, go back and do that again. Cause I really right. miss it. And yeah. And that kind of, it, it almost sounds like it's like a precursor to like metal shop masters. Like, so you, you had like a, yeah. you, you had a good, like, uh, experience at least with working with like just scrap pieces of metal not knowing exactly what you're going to do going into it and just kind of figuring oh, sure. it out on the fly yeah and i built a lot of stuff out of scrap metal anyways but uh but yeah definitely the competition aspect of it was there i mean having two weeks instead of 10 hours was a big difference but sure right. <laughs> but it was uh yeah it was at least a little bit of a warm-up and the the cool thing about that was is as we were always doing that i kept telling everybody there it's like you know they should put this on tv people would love this yeah and then all of a sudden i get a call from netflix and they're like hey we got an idea for a metal art tv show i mean we want you to be on it we want to fly out to california i, I mean i only had like two thousand people following me on instagram at the time i thought they were joking right. i was like no you're trying to scam me or something yeah like, right. good thanks but no thanks and they're like no we're serious here's a plane ticket come on down and I'm like okay i'm there <laughs> so i mean i don't know what the odds are that scrap fest would pop up out of nowhere out of david such his head the guy who owned the place just happens to agree that it's a good idea that I'm doing that thinking this should be on TV. And then not only does it get put on TV, but I end up getting called to be on that show. And yeah, none of this has any connection. Like the people out there in California didn't know about scrap fest or, or me or any of this stuff. So it's just the strangest progression. It's like, feels like something out of a book, you know, it's weird. Yeah. It's like, it was meant to be. Yeah. Right. It, yeah. <laughs> It's like you should have like gone to Netflix and pitched this like a couple of years ago or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, if I would have known how to do that, I would have. Yeah. Well, you figured out how to, you know, get get your artwork on in these huge, you know, installment pieces and in, around uh, communities in Michigan. That's, that's true. Yeah. I guess maybe if I just would have had more of a drive to do it. So, <laughs> so you said you had 2,000 followers on Instagram and it, you probably had a pretty... Um, small following in Michigan, obviously everybody knew your work in that area, but how did the folks mm -hmm. who created the metal shop master show for Netflix, how did they discover you? Did they ever explain to you how they, how they came across you? Well, yeah. Cause I actually asked them that because I mean, like I said, I thought that it was a scam or something. So I was like, okay, yeah. if you, if you really found me and want to put me on Netflix and you're going to fly me out to California, like you need to answer some questions. Like, first of all, why me? How did you find me? Yeah, because like around here, I was always like a you know little bit of like you know like well known locally because of all the public sculptures because they're large public pieces you know some of them thirty foot high and so so people around here know me but still like and then they told me that he found me through Instagram which was again another red flag and he's yeah. messaging me these things through Instagram like yeah. DMs and so I'm thinking yeah. this no way but he said he just went down a rabbit hole of hashtags because that was his job just to go through hashtags and look for metal artists and find people that he thought would uh, be good on the show. And, and he said, that's how they found me. Just 
going through a rabbit hole of hashtags and just dug me up out of out of that. So, so yeah. uh, we were talking at SEMA, and you you mentioned that um, that was your first time going to the SEMA show, and then yeah, it was yeah. months later or before that, it was your first time attending Fabtech. So this mm -hmm. so the Metal Shop Master Show is kind of expanded your world a little bit in the industry because i think you were kind of just focused oh, yeah. on the michigan area and you just it's blown up since yeah absolutely well the other thing i was also focused on was just kind of keeping my head down and working on this stuff i mean i knew about you know fab tech i knew about all these things but i was just always kind of i guess i had myself uh com you know a bit confused thinking that the way to you know get ahead and really make it was to just keep my head down, stay in the shop, keep working. So that's what I was always doing. I never really got out there much. I was just constantly trying to find the next job, build the next sculpture, you know, build the next motorcycle I was going to build, get in a magazine again. And, and I just never really got out there and talked to anybody. But yeah, it was because of the show that, uh, that that started happening because, I mean, even when I went to Fabtech, I wasn't planning on going. It was the people from the show, the other contestants that are like family to me now. Yeah. They were telling me, oh, you got to come. And I was like, well, I don't really have any money, but it's in Chicago, I'm in Michigan. I, you know, I could get a, a train ticket for 30 bucks. And so without having a place to stay or a plan or anything, I just threw a backpack over my shoulder and took a train. And uh, as soon as I got there, uh, I was joking around telling that story, saying I was just going to like sleep on a park bench or something. And Hypotherm heard me. And they were like, yeah. oh, we'll get you a hotel room. I'm like, what? Why would you get me a hotel room? <laughs> and I was like, oh, the show, okay. And they said they wanted to sponsor me, give me tools. It's like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Wow. Like, this is a whole new world, yeah. And then as soon as I was there and talking to people and meeting with people, that's when I started to realize, well, I've been doing this wrong, keeping my head down. I should have been getting out to these events a lot more often. But, uh, yeah, it took the people from the show to, uh, you know, pull my arm to get me out there. And, and now I, uh, I can't believe I never did it before. Yeah. So so let's talk about the, the show a little bit. You said... For sure. Yeah, you... You got the messages from uh, uh, producers for the show, and you thought it was a scam. And yeah. <laughs> so you packed a bag. They flew you out to, was it California, right? Yeah, Los Angeles, yeah. What kind of expectations did you have like while you were landing at LAX? Oh, all the expectations in the world. I was ecstatic. I couldn't believe I was going. This is like, you know, it was like a dream come true. It's like, are oh, you kidding me? You're going to put me on a, on a Netflix show doing my metal work? Like, this yeah. is... Uh, it's a hell of an opportunity. Like I was, yeah, I was geeked. I was excited. I was Ten feet tall. <laughs> yeah. Did 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 you know of of the the other contestants while beforehand, no. or did you kind of no. meet everyone no, right on the spot? Met everyone on the spot and didn't know any of them. Some of them knew each other because some of them had like a huge following already on uh, social media and stuff, and so they had recognized one another from that because they were kind of doing the things I wasn't really doing and getting out there better than I was, but. Uh, but I didn't recognize or know anyone. I'd never heard of uh, Joe Coy or, or Stephanie or David Madero sure. or, or any of the contestants. But then, uh, but then when I was uh, like, you know, back in my hotel room Googling uh, David Madero and I saw some of his sculptures, I was like, oh, I know his artwork. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't know who he was. That's crazy. But I knew his artwork. And as soon as I saw the artwork, I was like, oh my God, this is David Madero. Like, I know this guy. I know yeah. this artwork. This guy's an amazing sculptor. And like he's right there. How cool is that? So your mind is just like blowing up as, at this point, right? You're like, okay, I'm, you know, getting out there and like experiencing oh, yeah. like all that I've been missing maybe out in this industry. Yeah, it was very exciting and it was a lot of fun. I mean, even just to be, you know, just to be a part of that. You know, like I said, just to take that ride from one end to the other like that. It's just, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been crazy. It's been great. Right? Uh, the funny thing was too is I had uh, at the same time I had an NBC show making it wanted to put me on a, uh, a show with Nick Offerman and Amy Poehler they were asking me to oh, do sure. that and so but they were filming them at the same time so I had to pick one and I was like this is crazy like there's two wow. people that want to put me on a TV show at the same time and I'm just a just a metal sculptor from Michigan like how the yeah. So what the heck what, did these people find me? <laughs> well, yeah, no kidding. What, what was what was the determining factor between picking between the two shows? Oh well, I mean, it, the only really tricky part for me was the fact that it would be really cool to meet Nick Offerman and Amy Poehler because I love those two yeah. very much. <laughs> and so I was yeah. like, this would be a really cool opportunity. But I mean, at the same time, they're doing like a lot of just crafty things, and I can make anything out of anything. But still, metal is kind of it's my forte. So 
having the opportunity to go on a brand new show on Netflix where the whole point is you're building things out of metal. I mean, that's what I do. So I figured that's what I would really love to do. That was why I decided to go with that instead of the other. So one of the big things that impressed me, and I'm sure everyone else watching the show, and obviously the judges too, uh, David and Stephanie, um, was your ability to work with kinetics. Uh, hmm. How did that um, talent come about? Did you have to really work hard at it to figure it out or just kind of come naturally? No, that one's always come naturally for me. Yeah. I've always had a head for mechanics, yeah. Um, you know, like when I started the motorcycle shop, I, you know, I'd never gone to school or anything for any of this stuff, but I, I knew it, I understood it, and I'd done it. So, you know, I went out and I got certified. So a certified, you know, master mechanic for motorcycle repair. Um, but it's just, again, it's just something that's kind of always been there. You know, always been good at fixing things, understanding how things work. You can usually look at something and see how it goes together or how it could go together or should. And so when it came to the kinetics, it was literally just a love of machines and mechanisms tied together with a love for sculpting and creating, you know, anything that popped into my head. And so, you know, marrying the two together just seemed like the right thing to do. I've been making kinetic sculptures since I was pretty young. It was just something that just made sense to me. Yeah, it, it's but it, it's really impressed a, a lot of the people you met along the way. Like we were talking at, at SEMA again, we were talking to Luis Velarico and he was talking about this this whale you did, like this miniature whale that mm -hmm. just kind of had this smooth motion to it. And he was blown away that you just did that all by hand without any sort of like advanced technology or anything. Yeah, 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 I like that. That means a lot to me coming from someone like Luis because he's an amazing artist, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, I kind of appreciate that. And that was actually, there was a cool story behind that too, because that, that little whale that I made, that was like a little model. Um, but I built a big one for Scrap Fest. It was six feet long. And wow. I called it Jonah and the Whale. I had a little guy inside of his stomach all curled up in a ball, like in the fetal position inside the whale. And I had a ship's wheel on it. You turn the ship's wheel and the whale would swim. And I built it just because, you know, it was just something that popped into my head that I wanted to build. But the part that seemed like, you know, like a story, like too good to be true, was the fact that I ended up winning that year. Um, and they had bumped up the prize money to $2,000. Plus, they changed how much of the money that you would get after the piece auctioned off. And my piece broke a record for the auction. I ended up with like $5,000 after that show. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so, you know, I'd never had the money to uh to go on vacation or or take uh or take my my wife on vacation and i wanted to do that and so i took that money instead of using it towards bills or tools or anything i just said well let's just go to hawaii so we flew out to hawaii and we got out there and it just happened to be mating season for humpback whales so i just built a humpback whale got the money to go somewhere use the money to take us someplace nice because it's cold here in the winter yeah. and we get out there and we're literally looking at humpback whales and i had no idea that was even going on i'd never seen a whale in the wild and here they are in front of us and the only reason we're there is because i built one that yeah was crazy it was meant <laughs> it to was, be man <laughs> it was like you can't write this stuff yeah it was, it was just wild so yeah. so you also did on metal shop masters you also did uh some sea life uh treatment for the mobile uh, competition, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Talk us through that. Was that one of your favorite uh, projects that you did on the show, or was there another pr project that you preferred? Um, no, I wouldn't necessarily say that was one of my favorites, but it was a lot of fun. It was something I hadn't tried to do before, um, you know, because again, you have 10 hours. So one of the fun things about that is you have restrictions of tools, you have restrictions of materials, and the biggest thing, you have restriction of time. So when I was trying to come up with the things that I could build, you got to come up with them fast. And on top of having to come up with them fast, you also have to be able to create the thing fast. So you're, you're trying to work your brain around all those things at once. And it throws you in directions you wouldn't have gone before. So I would say that I loved working on all the different pieces for the show. And the reason why is because I came up with ways of doing things I'd never even tried to do them before because I had to. So it was like, well, I want this to do this but I'm limited on time for how I can do that. So what if I try this? 
maybe this would be a way to do this or that and just kind of throwing ideas around in my head and just building whatever I could as quick as I could. And it gave me a lot of ideas that have kind of like sparked me to go down different roads mechanically. So now I'm thinking about different things that the ideas actually got sparked from those, those little tight, you know, little tight constraints on that show. So sure. I, I like that aspect of it. So it's been quite a whirlwind for you since, since the show. What's, what's been one of the biggest takeaways you've, you've had since the show's aired and launched? Uh, partnering up with, uh, with tool companies has been a huge change, huge game changer for me. I mean, there's a lot of equipment out there that I've, you know, wanted and not been able to afford. A lot of the times the stuff that I have is things that I've had to buy used, you know, and only when they're like rock bottom. So it would be like keep an ear on the ground for auctions kind of thing. And that's kind of how I've always had to do things. It's always, always been on a, you know, a tight budget when it came to, uh, you know, all of that. So having these companies coming to me where it's like, okay, I'm running your machine. I bought mine when it was 20 years old and that was 10 years ago. And, and I love your equipment. And now you're coming to me and you're saying, you want to give me new equipment, update my stuff just because you like what I'm doing. And you want other people to see that I'm using your equipment, even though I'm already using it. Like that was just as mind blowing. And the, the stuff that I'm getting is making my life a lot easier. A lot of the stuff that I have, I've had to build myself. Like I needed a rotary draw tubing bender. I didn't have the money to buy one. So I just used a bunch of old car parts and made essentially like a, like a big clock. So it's like a 1700 to one gear ratio to get enough torque. So even though it's just a one horse, 120 motor running the thing, electric motor, by the time you get to the end of it, you're putting out, you know, like 5,000 pounds per square inch on a thing. So you can, you can turn and bend a piece of one inch or one and a quarter inch DOM tube to make motorcycle frames. Like I had to build that from scratch. And, you know, my English wheel, when I built this giant head sculpture by the capital of Michigan, um, same thing. I didn't have the equipment to be able to shape that sheet metal. Um, so I had to build a English wheel with a big enough throat to be able to actually form those panels to make something that large. And so it's, that's kind of how it's always been, you know, and I love making tools. I love making my own tools and I always will, but, but it's different when it's a necessity. Sure. <laughs> so it's, it's been a real game changer for me to be making these friendships with these people because it's not just companies. Like I'm dealing with these people talking to these people and I've become like really close friends with all of these people. So that's the kind of thing where I'll, you know, send them a happy Thanksgiving, you know, and they'll send one back and ask how things are going at the shop. Yeah. And, and it's just really great to have an opportunity to actually get the tools that I need to do the things that I want to do. It's like being on that show was just a game changer in so many ways. It's like, okay, once this thing is out and it airs, this is going to be the first day of the rest of my life. And it sure. has been. It's yeah. really changed things for me and made my life and what I want to do and what I want to pursue a lot easier. Now I still have a long way to go to actually do what I want to do because at the end of the day, I figure you should always ask yourself, if I could do anything with the rest of my life, money doesn't matter, what would I be doing? And then just take baby steps to do that, whatever it is. You don't have to just quit your job, uproot and go and do whatever it is to chase your dreams, but you can start doing it on the side after work. You can do whatever you have to to start building something until you can finally transition from one to the other. But if you're not chasing down what you want to do, if you're not actually happy with what you're doing, you're not doing what it is that you want to do, then you're just wasting the time that you have here. Nobody gets to the end of their life and goes, well, yeah, but I kept the bills paid. Like, who cares about the bills at that point? You know, enjoy your life every day of it. And so that's, that's why I've been doing what I'm doing. And I'm just, I'm slowly getting to that point. If I was doing whatever I wanted to do, I would be building kinetic sculptures. There's not a lot of money in that. You know, when I do public sculptures, I kind of stay away from kinetics because it, there's, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. There's things that can right. wear out and there's a lot more maintenance. Yeah, you don't want to have but, like that Michigan winter messing with. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and the more complicated you get, obviously, the more components you have, the more moving parts you have, the more things you have that can go wrong. But my real passion is making extremely complicated mechanisms. I want to build something that an engineer can look at and scratch his head 
I sure. want to build things that make people go, how the hell did you even think of this? And yeah. those are the kind of things that make me happy. Those are the kind of things that I really want to build and be able to build. But again, you don't really make money off of those things. At least I never have. It's just something that's interesting for people to see, but it's not the thing that you're actually making money on. So, so that's what I'm kind of working towards. If I could just build whatever I wanted to build. And then when I was done building it, there was someone out there that would buy it so I could pay the bills. And I knew that that was going to be the case. Like that's really where I want to be. And I feel like I'm finally getting there. Yeah. And that's a really nice feeling. Well, it's funny you say, you know, you want to build something that people scratch their heads at. Like, how did you how did you do that? We saw that in the final episode when you <laughs> built that uh, apocalyptic buffalo yeah. machine uh, and you just made it move. You got rid of the motor and you just made it move on a pulley system. And oh, yeah, I, the steering wheel, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and I know you, you they offered you a couple of helpers, but even they were like, I have no idea how, how you yeah, want to get this done. I I really didn't think about that. I, I mean, I'm good at working with teams, which was unfortunate that they really kind of made it look like I wasn't. But, but I can explain something to somebody in detail. And there's a lot of things that they cut out of all of that. Like I... I made them a working model. So I had like a poster board model made and I was, you know, it was during the pandemic. So we had masks. I was pulling the metal brads out of the nose pieces and making little, making little brads for the, uh, you know, for the pieces I was cutting out of poster board. And I had wheels on there that would move and I had the legs cut out into pieces and had all the different things in there. So I could actually spin this thing and go, this is exactly how it moves. This is all drawn to quarter scale. All I have to do is take these measurements, times them by four. The angles will stay the same. Just make these pieces, put it together. And this is going to work. You do these pieces. I'll do this. Go. And they were like, okay. And then they started going. And then later on, they came to me and they were like, okay, we don't know what we're doing. And I was like, why didn't you tell me that sooner? And then, <laughs> but then also, you know, I understand they were just trying and then just got to a point where they realized they could not figure it out. So um, it was actually one of them that had the idea. He said, well, I've got an idea. What if you just do this one wheel right here? You make one, make one leg that works on the wheel. And then we'll be able to look at that and we'll be able to copy that to make the other side. Like, okay, that's a good idea. So I whipped that out real quick and then got back to what I was doing. Then I go to see what they did and it wasn't like what I had done on the other side at all. <laughs> and so it was frustrating because it was just like, I know it was just that they didn't understand. And so it's not their fault. Um, but it was still just, uh, yeah, it was, it was more frustrating than it should have been. I should have been having more fun. And I was letting it get to me a little more than I, uh, than I should have. So I'm a little ashamed of that, but uh, that's not normally my style, but still it's, it was a competition and it was all this, you know, a bunch of cameras everywhere. And it was, I just got really into the, uh, got really into the game, I guess. But, uh, yeah, I mean, but like I, every, I, I think every I piece you did on that. Them. Yeah. I think every piece you yeah. did that show, you're like, I just want to kind of take it to the next level. And, well, and you did, yeah. but you know, I, I don't think it ever came across as, I think, I don't think anybody on that show came across as bitter or anything. No. Anytime, you know, no, if there's an elimination or if something didn't work out, because everyone we've talked to for this interview series and um, has just been super appreciative of having this kind of exposure to this part of the industry. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, that's actually, uh, that's been one of the coolest things about it is I've had a lot of people, you know, asking me like, you know, Hey, I used to weld in a, a factory setting, but I want to kind of get into metal sculpting now, or I've been inspired by this. I've never done this before, but I want to start, or, or my child wants to get into this. Like, where do I start? What kind of tools do I need? What kind of equipment do I need? So there's a lot of people who never even thought about this, who are now wanting to come into this yeah. because they're looking at metal fabrication from a whole different light. They're not just looking at it as bridges being built. You know, sure. They're realizing like, oh, I never even thought about somebody doing this, but now I really want to do this. Yeah, and so it's, it's, been, it's yeah, it's been really cool. Yeah, especially nowadays that you don't see a lot of shop classes available for high schools or for middle schools. You know, these types of things need to be exposed to the younger generation somehow, and I think this the show is a great avenue for that. Yeah, no, it absolutely is, and it is really sad that unfortunately that's kind of how things go. Which, I mean, if I'm being honest, I, I think that's wrong. You know, when whenever there's a uh, a budget shortage for a school the first thing that goes is you know art yeah. classes shop classes anything like that is just out the window and with shop classes those are skilled trades yep. i think a lot of these kids aren't going to go out and become a lawyer I mean, who the hell wants to be a lawyer <laughs> but but with uh 
with something like having a shop class, you might be able to find out that you're really good at something and that you really enjoy something that you're not normally going to get from school. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I didn't care about my math classes. I didn't care about any of my classes. Really. I was a terrible student as a kid. I was just kind of rebellious, but, uh, but I wish, you know, in retrospect that I would have paid a little more attention to the things, but I mean, you know, like now, like I barely graduated. Um, and I was like failing pre-algebra, you know, but now just because of my interest in what I do, I know trigonometry. So if you just would show kids things that they could be passionate about, you could find ways to teach them. You can't just yeah. shove people through the same system and expect it to work for everyone. It, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. I mean, you, you can learn different math, different ways to do math just by building something like you just said. You can learn yeah, engineering, exactly, yeah. you can learn all sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's a lot of ways that that things can be done different in schools, but that's a whole nother podcast. And I oh, can yeah. yeah. We, can, we can talk about that for hours yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, hey, yeah. Ivan, I, I really appreciate your time. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, nothing that I can think of. To be honest with you, it's just uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm honored that you asked me on, and yeah, yeah. Again, this is another one of those benefits of being able to do this is like get an opportunity to to talk to people like you and yeah. to uh, yeah to put this stuff out there and to yeah to remind people that it's uh, there is no such thing as too late and do what you want to do with your life. You know, sure. just kind of chase that down. And, yeah, being able to say that and being able to be heard by so many people now, it's uh, yeah, that's the biggest reward right there. Well, where can people find your, your, your work? I know you have a website, you're on Instagram and, sure, and Facebook. Yeah. yeah, if you go to, uh, uh, if you go to Instagram, it's uh, Ivan underscore Eiler, I-L-E-R, at Instagram.com. Um, and there's, uh, I'm on Facebook as well, but everything on Facebook is just kind of because you got that button you can click on Instagram, so it automatically right, shows yeah. it to Facebook. So you, you're yeah. better off following me on Instagram, I'd say. I tried doing TikTok too. I put things on there, but it's usually the same stuff as well. Just trying to uh, get out to different platforms. But uh, my website is IvanEilerStudios.com. You can find my work there as well. Awesome. Well, Ivan, we appreciate your time, and we hope to talk to you again in the future. And we're excited to see what else is in store for you. Well, I appreciate your time, Brad. Yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks Ivan. Yeah.